In this video, we look at a simplified summary of the story Ghost Camps of the Winters by George A. Thompson, which appeared in the August 1980 issue of the magazine Lost Treasure. When someone mentions Ghost Town, do you picture some desolate desert place where fragile board shanties burned black by a scorching sun stand half buried in drifting sand? If you do, you're not thinking of the century-old logging camp ghost towns of Utah's Uinta Mountains. Hidden deep in a green pine forest, close to a crystal-clear trout stream, these gems of the high country are more like picture postcard vacation scenes than they are ghost towns. But they are ghost towns just the same. Once they boasted stores and saloons and rang with laughter and shouts. People lived there and some died there. Today, century-old log cabins are all that remain. Everyone is gone now, except the ghosts and the little treasures they guard, so they must be ghost towns. Even if there aren't any sand dunes or hot desert winds. During the 1870s, the wild, unmapped Utah-Wyoming border country was the scene of the West's most unusual logging operation. As the rails of the Union Pacific were pushed ever further into the western deserts, the problem of obtaining cross ties for its heavy rails became every more troublesome. The mountains which separated the two future states were heavily timbered, but miles of desert-like wasteland separated them from the railroad. In order to bring the timber and the railroad together, the great Hilliard Flume was built, while laying their steel ribbons across the treeless wastes of Wyoming. Union Pacific engineers were constantly taunted by the sight of great stands of pine timber far to the south along the crests of Utah's Uinta Mountains. All across Wyoming, the forests stood distant and inaccessible, but as the rails turned southward into Utah, the mountains drew nearer, and timber cruisers were sent to explore them. The reports they brought back gave birth to the wild and woolly timber camps that are today's ghosts of the Uintas. Timber had been cut on the northern slopes of the Uintas as early as 1867, but it wasn't until the rails approached the future site of present-day Evanston that logging began on a large scale. Through the winters of 1867 to 68, Thai hackers cut and trimmed ties high on the windswept 10,000-foot peaks, waiting for the floodwaters of spring to float them to the desert valleys below, where the railroad was being graded. The spring runoffs came on schedule, carrying along great numbers of ties in its foaming fury. But thousands were left high and dry as the runoff subsided, and at least two men had been drowned trying to float them to the end of the track. A surer and safer way of moving the ties was needed, and as if in answer to a prayer, W.K. Sloan arrived on the scene. Sloan proposed construction of a giant flume to carry ties and saw logs from the forests to the railroad. To build a flume for so great a distance across a dry wasteland seemed like madness to the railroad workers, and they jeeringly called his idea Sloan's Folly. But undaunted by their ridicule, Sloan organized the Hilliard Flume and Lumber Company and began construction. It cost him $200,000, but it was repaid many times over by the millions of ties, saw logs, mine props, and countless cords of kiln lumber it carried. Sloan's flume was built in a V shape, with sides 30 inches high of whip-sawed planks 12 inches wide and 3 inches thick. It took 80 tons of heavy square spikes to build it, and when it was finished, it was 30 miles long. Most of its length snaked across dry, sage-covered flats where no timber grew, but Sloan had planned well. High on the crest of Gold Hill, near the headwaters of the Bear River, on a stream which would soon become known as Mill City Creek, he built a sawmill and a diversion dam to turn the creek's water into the flume. As the flume lengthened, timber for its construction was carried, from the sawmill to its terminus by the flume itself. The further the flume progressed, the more men were needed to cut timber to build and maintain it. Not far below the sawmill, a rough and rowdy timber camp sprang up. Naturally enough, it was called Mill City, and it wasn't long until it boasted a population of 500 lumberjacks, sawyers, and roughnecks. It had a company store, boarding houses, and scores of log cabins, many of which can still be found today. Their ruins, half hidden in the pines, hold dozens of little treasures, from lost or forgotten caches to old bottle dumps. 
Judging from the number of sun-purpled whiskey bottles being found by relic hunters, and from the tales of wild times told by old-timers, Mill City must have had a well-patronized saloon also. The Hilliard Flume ran from high on Gold Hill down Mill City to the west side of Hayden's Fork of the Bear River, which it followed downstream to where it crossed the river at the confluence of the East Fork. It followed the larger river for two miles more before angling off across the dry, sage-covered hills, heading for Hilliard, then only a whistle stop on the railroad. Often it crossed log trestles, as high as 16 feet above the ground, to keep it at the necessary grade, and its sections fitted so well that hardly a drop of water was lost. Its grade was designed so that water flowed through it as 15 miles an hour, carrying logs placed in it at Mill City to Hilliard in only two hours. When the last heavy planks were spiked into place and it began carrying a steady stream of saw logs and lumber into Hilliard, no one seemed to remember that once they had called it Sloan's Folly. So well did the flume do its job that Hilliard soon became a major lumber shipping point on the railroad. In addition to ties, the flume carried countless thousands of mine props and other timber for the mining camps of Utah and Nevada. At that time, most of the mines used charcoal to fire their smelters, and the Hilliard area also became a major producer of charcoal. There were 32 beehive-shaped charcoal ovens at Hilliard, as well as four others at nearby Piedmont and two more on Sulphur Creek. The kilns at Piedmont, long since a ghost town, still stand. Be sure to see them. The site of Piedmont, located near Evanston, is shown on most oil compani road maps, with a host of sawmills at its terminus to consume every saw log, and with rows of charcoal ovens waiting to devour every scrap of wood left over, lumberjacks at Mill City were kept busy keeping the flume filled to capacity. To feed the voracious appetite of the mills and ovens, a second flume six miles long, known as the Howe Feeder, was built up the Stillwater Fork from near its junction with Hayden's Fork. Logs coming down the Howe Feeder were caught in a mill pond and then fed into the main flume. To avoid log jams along the 36 miles of flume, lookouts were stationed where they could see for miles in each direction and could signal maintenance men by means of a heliograph. A second timber camp, remembered as Stillwater Camp, blossomed near the head of the Howe Feeder, while a large commissary camp was built across the ridge in the next canyon, on Black's Fork. Bunk houses and bachelor cabins were built among the pines at Stillwater Camp, but little remains today except for part of the old camp at the head of the Diversion Dam at the Noath end of Cletting Peak. But the old commissary camp on Black's Fork is a ghost town gem. The camp on Black's Fork was an outfitting or commissary camp serving all of the timber camps in the mountains beyond. Black's Fork was built in a circular shape, much like the old fort's mountain men built. Large horse barns, company offices, and a post office and store saloon were located in the center of a mountain meadow, surrounded by a circle of log cabins. It still looks pretty much today like it did nearly a century ago, except grass now grows on once busy roadways and the encroaching pine forest threatens to bury the aged cabins under a blanket of green. Like spokes from the hub of a wheel, wagon roads radiated out from Black's Fork to timber camps in the mountains beyond. Besides the camps at Mill City and Stillwater, loggers also built a now nearly forgotten camp on the West Fork of Black's Fork. The way to the West Fork camp is better given after the road to Black's Fork is described. To reach Black's Fork, take State Road 150 from Evanston southward into Utah. Six miles after crossing the state line, it's marked, a rough dirt road turns to the left, east. Follow it for 19 miles to the Black's Fork River, then turn left, or downstream, for 11 two miles to the old town site. Even though the road is rough in places, you'll be glad you came. Wandering among the old cabins, wondering about the people who live there is a rare experience. You can camp wherever you please and don't forget your fishing pole and camera. The river is only a stone's throw away and the trout are always hungry. And shutterbugs will love the old cabins half hidden in the pines. Be sure to note your speedometer mileage when you leave SR 150 and remember the crossroad 151 two miles from the highway. The road straight ahead leads to Black's Fork, but the left fork goes to Lyman Lake, only about a half mile away. It is an excellent camping and fishing area 
and you may decide to camp there while exploring the ghost camps of the Uintas. The right fork, rocky and rough, follows the West Fork upstream, where, with a little luck, you can find the old West Fork camp. Follow the West Fork Road upstream. It is rough in places and is nearly impassable for a low-slung passenger car. Watch your speedometer carefully and at exactly 51 2 miles from the crossroad leading to Lyman Lake. And just before you cross the West Fork, stop and park by the river. Be sure to spend a few minutes walking carefully along the riverbank, for if you do, you'll see hundreds of small mountain trout and perhaps a beaver also. During early morning and in the evenings, deer and elk often feed in the meadows along the river. Hike into the timber on the roadside of the river, not across the stream. Watch carefully for signs of old trails. It's not steep, and in about a quarter mile you should start seeing old cabins, some green with moss and almost buried under a green pine blanket. Cabins, barns, and unknown log structures are hidden over a half mile of forest. But if you watch closely, you'll see a dozen or more cabins in a nearly straight line, almost like the main street of a small town. This is the center of the old West Fork timber camp. Rusted remnants of tools, broken pieces of old-fashioned wood stoves, and long discarded logging equipment are strewn through the underbrush while hundreds of pieces of broken pottery and bottles mark the cabin sites. Perhaps if you're lucky, as I was, you might find an old stone whiskey crock from the Oak Saloon at Evanston. The road to Old Mill City is easier. Instead of leaving SR 150 as described, continue southward 51 2 miles past the Blacks Fork Road, or about 111 2 miles south of the Utah border, and watch for a sign at a forest road leading to the right, west, pointing the way to Gold Hill. The ruins of Mill City are four miles from the pavement. Only a few cabins and part of the diversion dam remain, hardly a hint of the camp that once was. You'll have to hike to reach the Anciant Silver Gray Cabins and Wooden Diversion Dam at the north end of Cletting Peak, which was once part of the Stillwater Camp area. Park your vehicle by the side of Hayden's Fork about a mile past, south, of the Gold Hill Road. Wade the shallow creek and climb the pine slope beyond. Be sure to watch for moose, for the willows along the creek are a favorite feeding place for them. Atop the ridge which divides Hayden's Fork from the Stillwater Fork, you'll come onto a mountain trail and soon begin seeing sections of the old V-shaped flume. It's the only place any of the old flume remains, and if you're a collector of square nails and spikes, you should have no trouble finding pockets full of them in the pine needles beneath the rotting timbers. The old cabins are about a mile further up the ridge. You can't get lost, just follow the flume to them. During the years that the Hilliard Flume and Lumber Company prospered, the logging camps it supported prospered also. Few records were kept at Mill City, but old-timers recall that it was a tough camp. There was no forest service then to prevent uncontrolled timber cutting and no law enforcement to control the exuberance of its rough lumberjacks. Like any isolated mountain camp with 500 men and no women, but with plenty of whiskey, fights were a daily fair. Who knows how many little treasures were left behind by men who cashed in their chips unexpectedly. And at the other end of the flume, Hilliard had its share of toughs also, but being on the railroad and perhaps more civilized, its fights were settled with six guns instead of axes. There is even less record of what life was like at Stillwater or West Fork. But it couldn't have been easy, at a 10,000 feet elevation where winter snows buried even two-story cabins. Timber cutters had to have their timber cut by spring to take advantage of the high runoff in the small mountain creeks, so they had no choice except to work during the harsh Utah winters. No doubt cabin fever drove some nearly mad and fights often erupted. I've heard of several killings at the Stillwater camp, and it is said that many died of smallpox at Black's Fork. If so, I've never found any such record nor found any cemetery. In time, the demand for railroad ties lessened, and coal from newly found loads replaced charcoal. Gradually, the great forests at the head of the Bear River fell before the woodsman's axe, and the sawmills began closing. In 1885, the last mill whistle sounded, and the great Hilliard flume lay idle. But even after years of use and making a fortune for its owners, it wasn't allowed to die peacefully. 
Its heavy planking was salvaged and taken to Hilliard and Evanston, where buildings and homes were built from it, some of them still in use. Today, Hilliard is only a group of wet-eared ranch buildings, while Evanston, once its suburb, is a first-class city. Today, a quiet walk among the silent pines and aspens along the Bear River reveals log cribbings and rotting trestles over which the Hilliard asterisk flume once ran. A line of rusting square spikes still marks its course, where a careful searcher may still find a broken axe head or perhaps a sun-purpled bottle. And if you listen closely, the sigh of the wind in the pines sounds almost like the rush of water carrying logs down the great flume once more. Maybe it isn't the wind, but only the ghosts of the winters, keeping their lonely watch over the camps that were built as a monument to Sloane's folly, the great Hilliard flume. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of this vintage magazine for yourself, or as a gift for a friend or loved one, please click the link in the description.